May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I am so pleased to be able to be here tonight as part of the Wilderness and Hope sermon series. I love putting those two words together. And tonight, I want to tell you about a time when I entered the wilderness when I was only 17 years old. Now, this was not a wilderness of um, trees and mountains. Uh, this wasn't a wilderness of the desert with sand dunes. This wasn't even a wilderness of the ocean when you're so far out you can't even see the shore. No, my friends, this was a wilderness of concrete and steel and subways and people. I want to tell you about the first time that I entered Toronto. <laughs> now, if you um, have never been to Toronto, or maybe if you've lived there your whole life and you don't really uh, understand an outsider's perspective, let me paint a picture for you. Uh, I had spent my whole life growing up in St. John's, Newfoundland. Now, St. John's is a capital city, so it's a very full, vibrant city, but it's still a small city. Like, it's the kind of place where if you're going to go out anywhere, like to the drugstore even, you've got to put on some makeup and do your hair because you're going to run into someone you know. And uh, I had a really good group of friends at church, really close community there. I had good friends at school. I was part of a community band and a community choir. On a regular basis, I spent time with people who had literally known me since I was a baby. I was part of a very warm, loving, supportive community. And I imagined my whole life being spent there. But my dad was really amazing at his job leading St. Thomas's Church. And a church from Toronto came headhunting, and our family decided to move to Toronto. So one day in July, I moved from a city of 105,000 people to a city of 3.8 million people. I googled those numbers just so I could be extra sure on that. Literally one July morning, I woke up and had breakfast in my hometown of 105,000 people. And by supper time, I was living in a city of 3.8 million people. Culture shock isn't even the word. Like first we need to talk about just how big Toronto is. To give perspective, in St. John's, you're in the city and you drive 20 minutes. Well, 20 minutes is gonna get you to Cape Spear, which is a beautiful lighthouse right perched on the edge of the continent. Um, you can go through Petty Harbor and you can see the ocean. You can be in those forests and trees and all that beautiful stuff. That's just 20 minutes away. If you drive an hour, you're going out of town. Like you are going somewhere if you drive an hour. Well, in Toronto, you can be in transit for an hour. You haven't left the city. Like it is just so huge. That first year, um, I took a gap between high school and university, and I was starting to do some acting and modeling and that stuff. So I was doing auditions all over the city, and I would be in transit for like 45 minutes. And I'd come up out of the subway, and there'd be like a whole new world, different from the one that I was living in. And then I'd take 45 minutes in the other direction. I'd come up, there'd be a whole new world. <laughs> like the city was just so big, and the people were everywhere. Like so many people. I couldn't believe how many there were and how every community was so different and you didn't see the same people twice. <laughs> and there was one day in particular, I remember being on the subway in rush hour. And if you live in Toronto, you know exactly the image that I have in my head right now. I was on the subway and people just started like coming into the car and they were all going places. And there was like this physical crush of people all around me. And I remember thinking so clearly, I'm in a city of 3.8 million people and if something happened to me right now, none of them would care. I was literally surrounded by millions of people. And I realized that I could just disappear. And not one of them would notice. And in that moment, I felt something I had never felt in my entire life. I felt lonely. My friends, tonight I want to speak to you about the wilderness of loneliness. Now being lonely is not the same as being alone. It's, it can be nice to be alone. It's, it's nice to have an evening alone with your book or maybe away in a cottage or sometimes people want a whole season alone. Alone can give us space, clarity. It can give us time to 
reevaluate things and learn new things about ourselves. Jesus loved being alone. He loved being in a crowd, but he was always taking time to be alone, get some space, clear his head, spend time with God. Being alone can be our choice. But being lonely is rarely our choice. Being lonely happens when we feel disconnected from other people. Being lonely means that you don't feel seen. You don't feel valued. You don't feel known. And as we stand here tonight, two years into a pandemic, loneliness has been rampant. And I'm not saying anything you don't know by saying that. Now, I am so thankful for this camera that I'm looking at right now. I'm thankful for all the technology that has kept us connected. It's, it's kept our infinitely more ministry alive. It's kept this Avent Cafe ministry going. It's allowed so many of us to stay connected with friends and family members across the country. And I am very thankful for all of it. But I miss seeing you. I don't know if you've cut your hair. I don't know if you're laughing at that or if you're giving me the sigh eye. It's different being so far away. It's hard to feel connected. And so many of us have struggled with that. And even now, as restrictions start lifting, I think it's going to be hard for us to still feel connected. Loneliness is real, and it's difficult, and it's hard to overcome. But this is not the Wilderness Sermon Series. This is the Wilderness and Hope Sermon Series. So where, when we are in the wilderness of loneliness, can we find hope? Well, I want to give you two things to think about tonight. And the first is this. I am with you always. I am with you always. More than 20 times in the Bible, depending on the translation, God says, I am with you. And when Jesus had his very last words that are recorded, the last words that he chose to say are, I am with you always. Now, isn't that a great little memory tool? I would love to take credit for that. Um, but this was a creation of a woman named Reverend Marjorie Pizak. Marjorie was um, a priest at the church in Toronto when we moved there. And she was a powerhouse. Like, she was, she was little. She was shorter than me, and I'm not tall. Um, but she was a powerhouse. Marjorie was the first woman priest ordained in the Diocese of Toronto. She created a church school system that was so revolutionary. Not only was it like packing out every Sunday, but people were coming from all around the country to study her church school system. And she taught generations of young people that when they feel alone, when they feel shy and scared, when they don't feel loved or known, God is always close at hand. You simply need to remember, I am with you always. So I hope that if you're feeling lonely, that little tool will just help remind you how close God is. And the other thing that I want you to think about is this. I moved to Toronto in July, and it was a good year and three months before I met anyone who would even remotely become a friend. Now, I have to tell you, as an extrovert, that's a long time to be without friends. I felt very disconnected and lonely. But I want to I remind you of a verse from our reading tonight. If you are just tuning in for the sermon part of this video, our reading tonight was from Isaiah 58, starting at chapter 1. And I want to thank MJ for reading it from the message translation. I find the message can be really direct sometimes. And this, this um, passage, God is really like, he's telling us what he wants to see from us. He's saying, these are the things that will make me happy. And there's a verse that really jumped out at me. It's around verse 7. And God says, what I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry. Inviting the homeless poor into your homes. Putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad being available to your own families. Do this, and the lights will turn on, and your lives will turn around at once. Now, I wish I had known that verse when I was 17. 
But here was my experience, that I was alone in this city and I had no friends. But a few months in, I decided to join a church choir. And then um, I tried volunteering with the Sunday school. And then I volunteered a little bit with the church bazaar. And the more I did those things, the more I started to feel connected. I didn't have friends yet, but I was, I was a little bit less lonely. I was really just trying to be useful. And in being useful, I started to find connection. I started to find hope in my wilderness of loneliness. The last two years have given us some truly unique ways to help other people. And I think now as our restrictions are being lifted and I think we're going to start leaving our homes a bit more, we will have even more opportunities to help other people. And I anticipate there's probably going to be a bit more need than we think there is. So if you are feeling lonely, I encourage you to find a way to be useful, to help someone else, to find a connection in a place that you might not have thought there could be. It doesn't need to be big, just wherever you are, with whatever you have, in whatever way you can, find a way to help someone. For in that you will find connection and caring. In the last two years, we have all struggled with loneliness. But in the wilderness of loneliness, there is hope. Find a way to be useful and serve someone and love your neighbor. And remember, at all times, God is always close at hand. We know it by his own words and his own promise to us. I am.